You ready to go in the storm this morning? I don't know. I don't know. Nobody sits in the front row. It must be the splash zone, right? <laughs> All right. Well, we'll try not to get the front row people wet, but uh, good morning. We actually are going to be going to the eighth chapter of Luke, and we're going to follow Jesus into the storm. Just a couple of preliminary comments. We just finished up a great two-day conference on marriage called Laugh Your Way to a Better Marriage, and I want to... That was a great conference. It was. But I want to I want to thank the unsung heroes cuz we had a whole bunch of people that just volunteered to make that that event so great. Thank you for serving. And uh if nobody else thanks you just please take it from me and thank you for serving the Lord through Creekside. I also want to say uh you probably caught the news that next week we're we're about to enter into a phase of intensive construction again in our chapel so we got this little window of time where we can show you great progress next sunday so make sure you go and you check it out because they have really moved a lot and uh, i wanted to give you an update too that the price tag for pulling this off was 1.2 million dollars we now have all but seventy-one thousand seven hundred and thirty-five dollars we've raised all the rest so thank you it's great progress. If you want to give to that, let's just finish that up and call that D-O-N-E. Let's call it done. But I uh, encourage you to walk through the progress in between services because we are just ripping up the pavement and Lord willing, we'll start another service at the 930 hour in January. That's our goal. That's our prayer. Okay. So let me talk to you a little bit about Luke chapter 8. You know, uh, Life has a way of throwing a lot of stuff at us, and as a result, storms happen, and you've probably been watching the news about what's going on in North and South Carolina with Hurricane Florence, uh, all the devastation. Even after the storm has passed, people are going to be spending months, if not years, trying to kind of clean up the mess of that. That's why we're going to kind of do a dollar at the door offering. Maybe our church, through just a little bit of a contribution, can help some families kind of rebuild and get back the life that they had pre-storm. But there's a lot of metaphorical storms that hit us as well. Like relationships that are important to us that break down, like kids that go sideways. Uh, the world just kind of makes bad choices and we're stuck paying the consequences of those choices. Your company gets downsized, your job is eliminated, your work situation just kind of sucks the energy out of you or you get bad news from the doctor. Maybe you can't stay even with the bills or you get in an accident and problems just seem to come out of nowhere. And when they do, they bring their friends along with them, huh? It's, it's funny. When problems come, they seem to come in groups. They're called storms, right? So I kind of hate the expression, expect the unexpected, but that's what we're heading into this morning is kind of expecting the unexpected. So if you're alive and you're breathing, you're going to have problems. You're going to faith, you're going to face faith stretching storms. It's not a matter of if it's going to happen. It's a matter of when it's going to happen, right? In John 16, 33, Jesus says, in this world, you will have storms. You will have troubles. You will have tribulation. You will have problems. You will have that group of friends we were talking about, right? But take heart because I've overcome the world. So starting at Luke chapter 8, verse 22, you have this series of bam, 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 four spectacular pictures of Jesus, miracles of Jesus. Now, most of the time when Jesus did miracles, he did them for big crowds, or he didn't do them for big crowds, but big audiences saw that. And they were, you know, sometimes crowds were curious, sometimes they were fickle, people had, you know, sometimes they just wanted entertainment too. But these four signs are actually primarily private, and they're very laser focused in on training his disciples, his closest friends. And he's got some life lessons he wants to teach them that they're going to, that are going to serve them for the rest of their lives. And that's what we're going to talk about, Okay. Uh, in, in uh, well, let me just kind of dive into the text, okay? This whole thing's kicked off in verse 22 with something that seems rather innocent. Jesus and his disciples want to get away from huge crowds by taking a break, going for a gentle sailing trip on the Sea of Galilee. If you were here last week, you'll remember that 
We ended the text with Jesus' family members coming to visit him, couldn't even get through. The crowds are everywhere. Everybody wanted a piece of Jesus. Miracles, uh, constant human need, thousands of people everywhere. The text tells us in Mark, it was so busy, they didn't even have time to eat. There was no time for food securing or preparation, just because everything was just suffocating and all the requests for Jesus and the disciples were overwhelming. So Jesus and his disciples said, you know, you can't sustain this kind of activity without breaking because Jesus became a man. He was God in the flesh. And so they decide that they're going to go out for a ride on the Sea of Galilee. What a great idea. Most of his disciples are fishermen. They know this sea like the back of their hand. This was the most comforting place for them is out on the waters. Most people don't own boats. Let's get away from people. Okay, get out on the sea. So we're talking about the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is a, it's the largest fresh body of water in Israel. It's about 13 miles long. It's about eight miles wide at its widest. It is, uh, if you've ever been up to Lake Tahoe, it's about two-thirds the size of Lake Tahoe. Similar size without Embro Bay, okay? Kind of a similar shape. Some call it the harp-shaped lake. Whatever you want to do with that, okay? At any rate... Jesus says in the text, hey guys, let's just get in the boat and let's go to the other side, okay? So they're headed to the other side, and they were on the western shoreline somewhere, so they're headed to the western side, probably the southeast part of the lake. It would have been like an eight, nine mile trip at most, but just understand, they're not in a hurry, because what awaits them when they get to the other side? More work, right? So they're taking a break, and they're not in any hurry, you know, they're going to they're gonna move slow, and... And it tells us in the text that while they were, they were just kind of being lullabied by the gentle currents of the Sea of Galilee, as they sailed, Jesus fell asleep. Mark, Mark's gospel tells us three other juicy little tidbits at this point. He tells us that it happened at nighttime that they sailed away because people were maybe going home or eating so they could escape. <laughs> It tells us he went to the back of the boat, to the stern of the boat, where the rudder was. There's a bit more space back there. And he also tells us, a kind of a cool little touch, that there was a cushion back there. And it probably wasn't a huge cushion, but geez, you know, when you're tired, you can kind of sleep anyway. You just kind of push a pillow or a cushion or make some makeshift cushion. Jesus just sort of accommodates a little bit and falls asleep. Have you ever been so tired you could fall asleep anywhere? We have three kids. They could fall asleep eating. I kid you not. We saw our kids fall asleep anywhere. I I could not believe it. Our kids could sleep standing up. And while we're laughing at kids, so can their parents too. I mean, even adults have some of the most non-glorious sleeping positions. One of my favorites is when people sleep with their mouths open. Some of the most glamorous people are really sketchy when they sleep, right? And they, their mouth is open. They're catching flies when they're sleeping. So, so Jesus, remember, he, he's the God man. He is God. He wrapped human skin around himself. So he, was, he suffered the limitations of what it meant to be a human. This is one of the great mysteries of the Christian faith. How God the Son fuses humanity with divinity when he comes down and becomes a human being and dwells for a while among us, right? And so to do that, I mean, he really had to sacrifice a lot to come down here and show us he loved us. He suffered pain. He suffered rejection. He suffered loneliness. He suffered misunderstanding. He suffered betrayal. He suffered frustration. He was tired. He was just tired. And so he falls asleep. Here's a really good little principle in the making about how if Jesus needed rest, maybe you and I do as well. Principle number one is that taking breaks to rest is God's idea. Failure to pace yourself will end badly. As some people think, oh, I'm so important to God that I need to work seven days a week. No, you don't. You don't keep the world spinning on its axis. You can take time off. The kingdom of God's not going to break down if you do. We have this Sabbath rhythm that's built into the creation week. He gives it in the Mosaic Law. God wants us to take breaks. He wants us to take rest because you cannot sustain the kind of pace that Jesus and his disciples were running with and maintain it for a long period of time. Something's going to break, and it usually comes out in a health failure. So learn from the master. Rest is a part of God's design as humans. Naps can be wonderful. 
pulling away into quiet and recharging, however you do that best. Some people like to be around people. Some people want to get away from people. Whatever it is that helps you recharge, that's good enough. It's extremely valuable. So they're getting out on the sea, and Jesus is sleeping, and the sea's got this nice little rhythm going. I've been to the Sea of Galilee. It's generally really calm. Now, back in the 70s and 80s, for those of you too young to remember this, just trust me, there was this program called Gomer Pyle. <laughs> and Gomer Pyle used to say, surprise, surprise, surprise. And that's what you get in this storyline here, okay? Because all of a sudden, out of nowhere, you get a wild storm. Expect the unexpected, right? It tells us in verse 23, second half of 23, chapter 8, Luke. A squall came down on the lake so that the boat was being swamped and they were in great danger. Everybody say, great danger. Great. Not danger, great Will Rogers or Robinson or great danger, right? It's just, this was serious. And Matthew, who was actually in the boat in his gospel, he says, suddenly a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat. This is not a normal storm. This is a crazy, crazy storm that came out of nowhere. All of a sudden, nature throws a curveball at them, and they go from complete calm to a raging storm really, really fast. That's what's happening here. I have to, let me, let me explain. Uh, I've been to the Sea of Galilee now a number of times, five times or something like that. It's almost always calm. I've only seen it once where it got wild, but it's almost always calm. But here's why. The Sea of Galilee is 700 feet below sea level. So you've got the Mediterranean Sea that's 700 feet higher that's about 30 miles away. Okay? And so what happens is, especially when it's warm down here, that nature abhors a vacuum. And so the Sea of Galilee is surrounded by mountains except for the southern end and one part in the northern part that have valleys. And what it does is the air from the Mediterranean Sea is sucked down the Jezreel Valley and it comes and it smacks the lake when you least expect it. And so it can go from calm to wild really fast. Luke actually says it came down on the lake. That's literally what happens. It's sucked off the Mediterranean Ocean and bam! It's just, you guys ever played that game where you get a towel wet and then you wind it up and that's what God did to the Sea of Galilee. Just kind of whipped up us. I know you're nice people. You would never do that. but It came down. We went from calm to red alert real fast. So here's the second principle this morning. And this is kind of funny, but it's kind of not. You have way less control over life circumstances than you think. I mean, I'm particularly talking to us control freaks. You think you can control circumstances, people? If you're a control freak, I don't want you to raise your hand. I don't want you to get embarrassed. Just have the person next to you give you an elbow right now, okay? Because you're, you're a control freak, and you know it, right? Some of us are even proud of it. That's even worse, right? You have way less control over the circumstances of life than you think. You elude yourself if you think you control where life's going. I know we work hard. We want a safe, predictable, comfortable world, and to a certain extent we can do it. But guys... No matter how hard we try to control our environment or people or circumstances, we simply don't shield ourselves from the stuff that's going to come beyond a certain point. Problems are still going to come. Jesus guaranteed it. Are you breathing? Are you alive? In this world, you'll have troubles. And so my mind goes to, and this is quite a while ago, my mind goes to the fact that my family wasn't prepared when my brother died in a car accident. We got no advance warning. It changed everything, guys. We were not ready for that. It redefined us as a family. Over the last two weeks, we have had precious people in this church go through some of the most horrendous storms I've heard about since I've been here at Creekside. I've been here now over four years. And as pastors, we get to hear the good news, but we also get to hear, hear the heartache. We get to hear about the storms uh, Last week, a, a young husband lost his wife. A young boy died in a car accident. People got cancer diagnosis. People are going through radiation and they don't have any strength right now. And there's a lot of stories like that. And it, by the way, they don't just happen to old people either. A friend of mine's got some heart concerns. You don't control that, people. 
But I'll just bet that life has forced you into a series of left-hand turns in the midst of heavy traffic as well. And maybe that's why you're here this morning. You're thinking, where is God in my storm? And I'm glad you're here. Because one of the secrets of storms is you need to run to God, not away from Him. We'll get to that. We'll get to that. But the ocean is just roaring. It's going crazy this day. By the way, do you know why the ocean roars? Does anybody know? You would too if you had crabs on your bottom. <laughs> Woo! Okay, never mind. Okay, sorry. Sorry, never mind. Take it back. Forget that word picture. Come back to me now. Okay. All right. Just, just wanted to see if you're awake. Okay. All right. This side's awake. You guys stay asleep. Okay, it's okay. It's dark outside. You can't see the other shoreline. The ocean is, the sea is raging. We'll not say roaring. The waves are big enough that they're slapping over the sides of the boat. They're trying to bail water. It's coming in faster than it's going out. They're going to die. It looks really, really bad. It looks really, really hopeless. And probably the most frustrating thing of all of this is while they're panicking and freaking out, Jesus is still sleeping. Don't, if the water is that intense and it's a very dangerous storm, don't elude yourself. Jesus is soaked. He's soaking wet. And he still didn't wake up. Man, I bet an earthquake couldn't have wakened him up. He was tired. Man, what a story this is. And the disciples think they're going to die. And Jesus does, he's just, what are you? What is, and sometimes you, you people, us people, <laughs> we think God's asleep when we're in the storm, huh? Mm, mm. So the experts do what experts do. They panic, right? These men were seasoned sea wolves. They knew the Sea of Galilee like the back of their hands. But this one is over their heads. This one is way past their ability to control. Isn't that fascinating that God in this story, he doesn't go after what they were weakest at. He goes at what they were strongest at. It's like God saying, no matter how great you think you are at what you think you do best, you will always need me. You will never not need me in your life. And sometimes he'll let us fall flat on our faces to discover that too. Now, if you've ever been on a tour to Israel with us, I see some people that traveled with me to Israel before we're going on our third trip in, in March. Uh, they have this thing called the Jesus Boat. It's in Nof Ginezor. In 1986, they made a spectacular archaeological discovery. There was, a, there was a drought, and so the water levels of the Sea of Galilee were unusually low. Two brothers were wading through the mud in the northeastern corner of the lake, and they found a spectacularly preserved boat that goes back to the first century AD. Hence, they, they lifted it out gently, they preserved it, and it's now on display for people to see. It's 27 feet long, seven and a half feet wide. It could have held 13 men easily. Was it the boat? Probably not. Was it a similar? Probably. But regardless, this boat reminds us that we're talking about time, space, history. This is not a little fable. This happened. Jesus and his guys got in a boat, went out on the lake, a storm hit, they thought they were going to die. And it's, and it's just cool when you see these little confirming bits and pieces of history that show you, I mean, the, the reality of the fact that people sailed across that lake just in the way that's described, and the experts are panicking. They've lost hope. They've, they despair of dying. Their faith has evaporated like water in the month of August in the hot Central Valley, right? It was dark. Because it was dark, they couldn't see the far shore. They didn't know how close they were to shoreline. Water was filling the boat faster. They could bail it out. You do the math. It looks like, there's, looks like they're close to the end. It looks like, looks like they're going to go down. You don't swim out of that stuff. Not when it's that wild. This was not a normal storm. You do the math. They're going down. That means Jesus is going down too. That's what they thought. They did everything they knew how to do until finally they said, hey, we have a good idea. We're expert fishermen. Let's wake up a carpenter to help us with a storm. <laughs> right? Okay. The storm was beyond their limits and they didn't know where else to go. So it tells us they woke him up in verse 24. The disciples went and woke him saying, Master, Master, 
We're going to drown. The Greek is a little more brief. Help! No, no, I'm just kidding. But it's, it's, have you ever panicked in a storm? I mean, this kind of reminds me, I, okay, I have too many windows open. Close this window, that window, that one. Okay, listen, this storm, when I was reading this storm, I did it again. Have you ever caught yourself reading the New Testament going, oh, those silly disciples, they should have known better. Come on, you guys, grow up. You're like the three stooges, you know, just, and then God says, really? And how would have you responded, Scott? Man, I think we would have responded the same way. I think this story is for you this morning. I think it's for me. I, these guys are normal. That's the whole point of this Gospels, right? And they're despairing of dying. So how do you, how do you respond in the storm? Do you panic? Have you given up hope that you're ever going to make it safely to your destination? It's just so easy to be a person of faith when everything's going zippity doo dah, huh? But you bring on a storm where you start to get wet because the waves are slapping you. We'll see what you're made of. How do you deal with the storms of life? Does your faith come to the forefront or does it fall off the back bumper? Is fear stronger than faith in your life? How are you handling the storms of life? I, I, I want to take a little detour. This is kind of a sidebar. And, and I'm going to do a really quick college course called Stormology 101. Okay? All right, Stormology 101. Because I think this is what God would speak to people when they're in the storm. Okay? First of all, get a new perspective. In a fallen world full of sin, where you and I by default are far from the thoughts of God, newsflash, we need storms. We need them. Otherwise, we'd never wake up. We'd never grow up. We'd never figure out what God's trying to say. You and I need storms. So stop praying that storms will never come because God will say no to that request because you need them. He loves you too much. So get a new perspective. Storms are not necessarily bad. Doesn't mean everything that's bad that happens, God says, oh, yeah, take that now. And we're not saying God's a capricious, mean God. But we do need storms. Second of all, adversity builds faith. That's the whole point of the storms. The, 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 roots go deeper when there's a drought. Roots go deeper when there's less water. And your faith goes deeper when it's tested if you respond correctly. It gets strengthened. I'll give you a classic illustration. James underlines these first two points when he says in chapter one of his book, it's a little brief book, five chapters, he says, consider it pure joy. I'm going to read the whole text. You've got an abbreviated version on the screen. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. In other words, when you face storms of many kinds. What a weird attitude. Be joyful when you face raucous storms. What? It's because you need them. Because you know that the testing of your faith will develop perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Do you see? It's the storms that build the faith muscles of life that will get you safely to your destiny. Our desire, you gotta, this is the difference between the eternal perspective of God and the temporal perspective of man. We're thinking here and now, this 70 year lifespan, God's thinking forever, right? So our goal is cash and comfort. God says, I want you to be the best version of you. I want to prepare you for eternity. So those two are going to conflict a lot in life. And so we need to understand that storms are good, storms, storms are purposed, storms help build spiritual muscle, they build commitment, they build perseverance, they build stamina, focus, clarity, hope, they shape you into becoming like the Lord Jesus Christ. That is God's best plan for your life. Which leads me to um, point number three in Stormology 101, which is to turn to Christ in the storm. Um, I've talked with a lot of people that basically say, because these bad things happened in my life, I just walked away from God. I just walked away from the faith as though they're punishing God. You're punishing yourself when you do that. You're not punishing God. 
It seems kind of absurd to me. Well, this bad thing happened, so I'm not going to believe anymore. I said, okay, so if somebody gives you a $20 bill that's a counterfeit, does that mean you're never going to spend money again? Instead of running away from God, you run towards God. Instead of focusing, by the way, on your big problem, focus on your bigger God. Have you, have you ever done this little space comparison thing? So are, would you consider yourself a big person? I know I need to lose some weight, so don't, don't come after me right? too hard. But I'm a pretty good-sized guy, right? Uh, how about comparing me to Elk Grove? Uh, smaller. How about to all of California? Not all the people, just the whole landmass of California or America. I'm a cosmic booger by that time, right? I'm just a... What about the whole world? I'm smaller still. What about the cosmos? We live on this planet that spins in space, who knows how, around a star that's one of the smallest stars in the great billions of galaxies out there that God made, just kind of sent them spinning into space. Do you think God's bigger than your problems? Get perspective, people. Get perspective. One person this, this week, uh, I'll tell you, it was Phil Fuller. He said this. He said, we're supposed to glance at the storm and gaze at our Savior. But what do we do? We tend to gaze at the storm and glance at the Savior and think ill will of the Savior too. This is the time when you start, in the storm, you start doubting the goodness of God or the presence of God or the power of God. And you start thinking he's fallen asleep. He can't help. I'm doomed. Or you think worse, he doesn't care. That's actually what the Gospel of Mark says in the same account. They wake him up and say, Master, don't you care that we're drowning? I mean, it's like a rebuke with an accusation bar mixed in it, right? Don't you care? Of course he cares. He made you. Okay, get newsflash. We're selfish people. Even having said that, God loves you more than you love yourself. So we need to settle that in our hearts. We are not alone in this universe. There is a loving God that knows your address and the number of hairs on your head. He wants, he wants to walk with you. So instead of running away from God in the midst of the problem, it's a lot smarter to run towards God because he's the Lord of the storm. Which leads to the driving principle of Stormology 101. You have to choose whether fear or faith will be dominant, the dominant influence in your life, particularly as you go into problems. What's it going to be? Is it going to be fear that drives you or faith that drives you? It's the classic, hey, why pray when you can worry? Do you see what I'm saying? Listen, fear and faith are not good friends. The Bible tells us that either fear is going to chase faith away or faith is going to chase fear away. So what's it going to be with you? And I know you're in church, you're saying, well, obviously faith. Well, let's put you in a trial. Let's get you a little wet. And we'll see. We can't control life circumstances, so the options are rather limited. A, be carried away by worries, anxiety, fear, panic, hopelessness, and despair. Or B, latch on to God like a barnacle and trust him to get you to safe harbor. It seems like it's about that simple. You can't control life circumstances, but you can control your response. You can filter it through faith. I, you know, you, there was a little kid in a Sunday school class that when they were reading about this story, he said one of the smartest things I've ever heard about this text. He said, do you think any boat can go down if Jesus is on board? Takes a little kid to figure this one out, huh? If Jesus is in the boat, it's not going to sink. Do you understand that? That's Sunday school level stuff here, folks. But it's good theology, too. Well, what about when you experience the death of a loved one? That's hard emotionally, man. Talked with a wife, or I talked with a woman after the second service that had been abandoned by two husbands. Not easy, a big accident, a diagnosis of cancer, an investment you were so sure about that went bad, 
broken relationship, a pink slip. I mean, the disciples felt that if the boat went down, that everything Jesus came to do would go down with them. And that the kingdom of God would fail and sink to the bottom of the Sea of Galilee. Is that possible? There's a right answer to that question, people. It's absurd. It's absurd. Now, I want to I wanna just say this, and it's not in your sermon outline because it's a little bit of an ouch, but Jesus was not disturbed by the storm, but he was disturbed by the lack of faith of his closest followers. That bothered him a lot. You catch that? He was disturbed by the exact opposite thing that the disciples were disturbed about. They were focused on the storm. He was focused on them. And so they wake him up and they call on the weatherman, right? Verse 24, second part of it, it says, He got up and he rebuked the wind and the raging waters. The storm subsided and all was calm. And he turns to his disciples. You saw it in the video at the beginning of the message. Where is your faith? He asked his disciples. Matthew puts it brilliantly. He says, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? You of little faith, why are you so afraid? It reminds me, we had three kids. It reminds me of thunderstorms when your kids freak out and they jump in bed under the covers between mom and dad. And you gently tell them, it's not like Jesus is just blasting them out of the water. They're human, right? Where is your faith, honey? You can go back to bed. It'll be okay. Why are you so afraid? I don't know. We're going to die. And so we see Jesus get up. No panic, no fear, no worry, no doubt about the outcome, no hesitation. He just gets up and says, silence, be still. Man, I wish that worked with our kids. I don't even know if he yelled, though. He could have just said, silence, be still. But it's interesting. The text says, in all three Gospels, he rebuked the wind and waves, which is exactly how he treated demons. And you'll see it next week. He rebuked them. And that's a little weird. Some theologians say, why? Because there's a, there's a possibility that the demonic spirits had churned up the crazy abyss of the Sea of Galilee in an attempt to take Jesus and his plans down. And just as Jesus sent the demons packing, come back next week, he sends the storm back into calm. He rebukes the storm. He takes control of the wind and the waves. And in case you missed it, the main point of this whole thing, theologically at least, is, is that Jesus Christ has power over the elements of nature. Even the wind and waves obey him. The storm shut their mouths like the mouths of the lions were shut in Daniel's cave. He just shuts them down. This is, they, this is no storm like what they'd ever seen, but this is no solution like what they'd ever seen either. They're shocked by what they see here. The miracle demonstrates beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus Christ is Lord of the wind and the waves of nature. He's Lord of the storm, and by way of inference, he's Lord of your storms, if you'll let him. I, for the astute Bible student, now, do we have any astute Bible students here this morning? There's actually more here than you thought. Because in the Old Testament, only Yahweh, only God Almighty has control of the elements of nature. You think of the story of Jonah, where there was a wild storm, they threw him overboard, God brings calm. The Psalms that speak of God alone being the one who brings calm to the storm. And here's Jesus bringing calm to the storm. For the astute Bible student, we're being told that Jesus is God. He's God fully, but he's also man fully. He fell asleep, people. And somehow, in this marvelous mystery, they were fused into one body and he dwelt for a while among us. Ah, it's just so cool. But whether the devil was the one that caused the storm or not, Never forget that the God, the God is ultimately and sovereignly in control of every human life. And there's nothing that will ever come your way that doesn't first pass through the loving heart of a sovereign God. 
God gets the last word, not circumstances. That's the difference between a believer and an unbeliever. An unbeliever just lives in the panic and the fear of the unknown. The believer knows there's a, there's a sovereign hand and heart underneath all of it. There's a purpose and God's got us. I know this is a bad metaphor. Don't squeeze it too tight. But it's like God seeing us as cookies that he puts in the oven. He always keeps an eye on the temperature and he always keeps an eye on the clock. So that the cookies turn out just right. Now, don't push the metaphor too far because God doesn't eat us when we're done, right? Okay, don't go there. I saw you going there. Don't go there. Man, do I want some schnickerdoodles right now, right? With my honey walnut shrimp, I want them today. All right. But this is interesting. There's a double rebuke here. There's a rebuke of the storm. And then there's a soft rebuke to his childish disciples that feared all was lost when he was in their boat. Where, why do you have such little faith? Why are you so afraid? They should have known better. And by way of inference, we should know better. Which leads to principle number four. Principle number four is your next storm could be different particularly if you let Jesus in your boat. Your next storm doesn't have to result in you just losing perspective, being filled with fear and panic and anxiety. Your next storm can have the peace that comes from understanding there's a sovereign, loving heart that never lets something come into your life if there isn't something good that's going to come, even out of something that seems totally bad. Your next storm could be really different if you just let him in your boat. In your worship folders this morning, there's this little card right here. Would you pull this card out? It looks like Jesus. It says, I want Jesus Christ in my boat, right? You see that one? Why don't you pull that out? What that is, is it's just simply a prayer. There's nothing magical about it, but I just kind of created a prayer that expressed based on this Stormology 101 language we're looking at, how somebody that has Jesus out of their boat can get somebody metaphorically in their boat. And I did this when I was like 18 years old. I knew about Jesus but until I had an encounter with Jesus where I actually realized he was there, he's here this morning, and that he wanted to come into my life and become my master and my Lord, until I figured that out, I was still trying to operate on my own steam without Jesus helping me. So uh, what I want to do is just read this prayer. And if it, if it expresses what you'd like to say to God this morning, we're going to go about silent for about 60, 90 seconds after I do this. And you can just pray this directly to Christ this morning. He's here, folks. He's raised from the dead. He says, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, I'm there. He's here. So here's the prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, now I now understand that you are greater than any problem that life can throw my way. I cannot survive the storms of life or navigate my soul into eternity unless you're in my boat. So I choose to believe in you today. Your death on the cross made a way for my eternal forgiveness and deliverance. And your resurrection from death is proof that nothing can stop you. So please forgive my many sins and save me forever. I ask you into my life today as Savior and Lord. Thank you. Amen. If you've never prayed a prayer like that before, can I encourage you just in the silence of about the next 60, 90 seconds, to just talk with your God this morning and do that. Take that step. For those of you that have, let's just pray for about a minute and a half, okay? God, how vividly I remember the day that I received your son into my life. 
And my mind goes quickly to that promise that says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So Lord, I pray this be a time of great faith opening to you. And Jesus, we thank you that whoever comes to you through humility and confession, I mean, that's what you want most. Expressions of faith, raw, humble faith. So thank you, Jesus, for being a great Savior. Amen. Listen, I want to just one more step. I'm not done with the text yet, but if you made a first-time profession of faith this morning, we're just going to ask you at Creekside. God says, don't try to do this privately. I want you to go public with this. The way we do that, if you just flip that card over, is just to ask you to own that decision. And you own it by just telling us about it. You fill that out and you turn it in. You just mark that little box that says, I'm surrendering my life over to Jesus for the first time today. And you just tell us who you are. We're not putting you on some big long mailing list or something like that. I will tell you, I'll send you an email or a letter just, just giving you a few tips on what it means to walk with God, especially early on because I stumbled for a few years before I figured some stuff out that I'd like to save you some pain. And just kind of figure out how to get off to a great, strong start with God. So all you just, just, you just can fold that and turn that and drop it in the offering when it comes by here. I'm, I think the service is over in about four hours. So, okay. All right. I'm just kidding. I'm getting hungry. So we're, we're going to end real quick. Okay. Uh, What's interesting is the last little bit of this text is a little nugget because it's redirected fear. It's not that fear goes away when the calm comes. It's that they redirect it. Look at the end of verse 25. In fear and amazement, you go, wait, 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 I thought that storm's gone so they're not afraid anymore. No, they just shifted it over to a different object. In fear and amazement, they asked one another, who is this who commands even the winds and the water and they obey him? Don't miss this little detail. They were freaked out by the storm. Jesus calmed the storm. And now they're looking at this guy again going, Ho! They'd been with him for almost three years and they'd never seen that. This is not normal what he just did. I can imagine him kind of backing away and leaving him in the back of the boat by himself. As they're saying, who is this that even the winds and the waves obey him and say, yes, Sir, complete raging storm, complete calm. Bam! I agree, whatever that kid was saying, I agree. In fear and amazement, they asked one another, who is this? He commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. Here's the interesting thing. Some people think, okay, so really, what we're talking about is them now fearing Christ. And some people think that means terrorized paralysis. That's absolutely not what fearing God means. It's a constant phrase in the Old Testament. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is to hate sin. There's, that fear of the Lord is a constant Old Testament concept. But when you fear the Lord, it isn't this paralyzing terror. It's this purifying, empowering, beautiful thing that reverentially takes control of you and you reproportion issues and you, your fear object is now God and so all lesser fear objects just vanish when you get a clear view and vision of God. It empowers you to live life. It brings peace. It's counterintuitive. You think, oh, the fear of the God. I'm gonna, I, can't, I can't even sleep tonight. No, I sleep better when I fear God. I have a better marriage when I fear God. The fear of God makes everything better. Yeah, and so we fear God. And so they say, who is this? And you go, well, just stop. You've already been with him for like three years. You should know better. St I've walked with Jesus for over 40 years. And there are still times when I, there's a new lesson that's coming. And I go, oh, didn't see that. There's new horizons about Christ. I'm still discovering. And if truth be, don't tell the other services I told you this. I'm a pastor. I shouldn't do this. There are many times when Jesus has to whisper in me, not Scott the pastor, just Scott the Christian. Why do you have such little faith, Scott? Why are you so afraid? Have we trying this big thing and it might fail? Why are you so afraid? Did I lead you into that? Yeah, I think so. Well, then chill, trust. And I have to come back and remember, 
I'm not just a pastor. I'm a Christ follower. I don't get a pass on this. You will always discover, you will always learn from Christ. That's why I think he gives us eternity. This life, you're not going to get it all in this life. I don't think you get it all in eternal. God is without end. So, so this, listen, this, this is kind of real simple. Jesus takes complete control over power. He reminds us he's, he's the Lord of the storms. The bottom line is if, if, if you meet somebody that can control the weather, you should be their friend. It's real simple. This is, not, this is not rocket science, guys. If you meet somebody that can alter wild weather patterns, you should get to know that person. Okay? Uh, if, if, if he can send the powers of hell packing, come back next week, then maybe you ought to trust him with your life. If, if, he, if you find someone that can offer you forgiveness and cleansing and a new start and love and hope and clarity and purpose and a future, if he can even reverse physical death, come back two weeks from now, right? Maybe you should make peace with that person. Get on their side. You know, say, no, I'll bring them over to my side. Well, maybe you should go over to their side. Hey, this is real, I, there's people here this morning, I know because I was you years ago. You don't have this whole Christian thing figured out. I'm glad you're here anyway. That's what we do in church. We're a hospital, right? We help people, right? So even if you don't have this whole Christian thing figured out, it's real simple. I, I'm, not, I'm being funny, but I'm not being funny. Here's a guy. We follow him because he was dead. And then three days later, he came out of the grave. I'm with that guy. I want to beat death too. I want to beat all the storms of life. If he can defang and declaw even death, that's my biggest fear in life. That's the biggest of them all. I'm with him. Christianity is pretty simple, really. I'm with that resurrected guy. So we let him into our boat. Remember, you don't get a pass on problems. In this world, you're going to have storms. You're going to have trouble. You're going to have trouble. But be of good cheer. Take heart. I've overcome the world. It's going to be okay. So here's the deal. We pray, oh, God, deliver us from this storm. And sometimes God says, yes. And we get this deliverance and we tell this great testimony before the crowds. But sometimes it doesn't play out that way. You say, God, deliver me from this storm. And he says, this time I'm going to deliver you through the storm. You're asking for deliverance from, I'm going to give you strength and endurance through. Oh, no, I don't want that. No. No, no, no. Well, all the roots go deeper when it's dry. Hmm. So I'm going to strengthen you, and you're going to weather this, and you're actually going to be stronger than if I delivered you from. I'm going to deliver you through this time. Uh, I didn't sign up for that. So, he's the Lord of the storm. Last principle. You are neither free from tribulation nor helpless in tribu tribulation, but in Christ, you are victorious over tribulation. In this world, you will have tribulation, but be of cheer. I have overcome the world. There is nothing more powerful than the Lord Jesus Christ. This story doesn't just point to the fact that Jesus is Lord of nature. It also points to that. The real lesson is that the disciples should have trusted Jesus in the storm. We should trust Jesus in the storm and not just be corrected after the storm, but learn and grow in the storm. Jesus Christ is more powerful than anything that life can throw your way. Let me give you an illustration. The church of Jesus Christ should not exist today. For 20 centuries, it has been hated everywhere it's gone. And the heat is growing in the American culture as well. But guess what? We're still everywhere. Everywhere. The gates of hell will not prevail against something Jesus is building. If he's in the boat, it ain't going down. Oh no, the church is going to stop next. After the midterm elections, the church is done. What? What? Come on, third service. The forces of hell have continually assaulted Christ and Christ's followers. He's got you. He's got your storm. 
Glance at your problem. Gaze at your Savior this morning. Because after the whole battle is fought, after all the cannon fire and the air support and the explosions and the arrows and the blood and the smoke and the fog and all that stuff dissipates, the last man standing will always be the Lord Jesus Christ and anybody that stands with him. He is the last man standing and he's got you and he's got your storm. If you... And here's where I want to just flip it, and then we're done. We're just flip it, because I've been telling you to ask Jesus to get into your boat, and that's bad theology. You need to get in his boat, because when he's in your boat, you're holding the rudder. Oh, no, 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 no. He wants to, you to get in his boat, because he's holding the rudder, and he's going to take you places you didn't sign up for, because he's the Lord of the storm. Come back next week. I'll show you one of those places. <laughs> He's the Lord of the story. So, so, don't clap. This is supposed to be heavy. Okay. Why do you have such little faith? Why are you so afraid? I've got you. You're mine. And if you're in me, you're not going down. Oh, God. As, uh, I know, God, we're here at this time in our service where we call our ushers. We receive our offering. We do that. We sing. We praise you. There's got to be a response after hearing about the Lord of the storm. But, Lord, um, we just want to thank you that you are so realistic about what we experience and the fear that we deal with and and how you address us. And I, I just hear in this story, you're not blasting the disciples. You're gently calling them back to reality. And God, we invite you to call us back to reality. To not let fear drive our life, but to let faith drive our life. Jesus, I want to pray that we not just learn lessons after the storm. I want to pray that we learn them by faith in the storm. Going through the storm. Of course we ask you for deliverance from the storm. When it's your will. But when it's not your will... We pray for strength and endurance and faith in the trial, in the storm, for your glory and for our growth, because we know you're preparing us for eternity, and we will always adore you for that. And all God's people said, amen. God bless you.